Welcome to this uh, episode of On the Front Lines. Our audiences are live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch. Um, today we have with us Professor Shanta Sinha. Uh, Shanta Sinha has been a child rights activist for uh, at least three decades, and uh, she has been on the front forefront of the child labor move, ch anti-child labor movement for very many years. Uh, she is also the founder of MV Foundation, and today uh, we are going to talk to uh, Shantaji about the issue of children during the COVID pandemic. Uh, welcome, Shantaji. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Shantaji, one of the most, one of the most moving images uh, during this crisis has been that uh, of a woman who was carrying her dead child uh, in Jehanabad in Bihar. Uh, unable to find an ambulance. Uh, and that really brought forth uh, the biggest challenge uh, that children are facing uh, because they are almost voiceless and invisibilized uh, during this situation. What do you feel is happening to children all across the country uh, during this situation? Uh, since you started with the most uh, tragic of stories, and I, I had looked at another tragic story where a mother had to drown five of her children into the Ganga River because she couldn't uh, meet the hunger of those children. So we are coming across very, very tragic stories about children and the families becoming hungry and children have no voice and there are no institutional arrangements or support to keep children not starving, not being hungry and not being anxious, not having despair. So I think we are going through, uh, 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 I, I don't even know how to define it. There's no vocabulary for it. Do we say humanitarian crisis? Do we say moral crisis? Uh, really, I, I, it's unthinkable. And we will have to really think of some new vocabulary to describe what we are seeing at the moment, especially about children. And there's more we will have to talk about. But I'm just saying that we have failed our children today. But I should still think we do get energy from some positive stories here and there. But on the whole, it has been uh, quite a despair. So um, a, a large number of children today are unable to access school. And while some of the most privileged children might be able to move into uh, digital classrooms, uh, what do you think is happening to the large majority of children with respect to access to education? Uh, I, I, I would uh, not worry so much about their not being access to education. I have my own views on the matter, you know, uh, and I would not want to compare the rich children with the poor children and somewhere trivialize the issue of what is happening to children as a whole. I think all classes of children are facing uh, uh, their own uh, 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 specific issues which, which should be uh, worrying us. So let us not make this uh, distinction of the rich and the poor. I think uh, children are children and they all need a kind of care and protection and attention and I'm sure they're going through, they all have certain, even rich children have questions to ask and they need to be comforted. They want to know how long this is going on. How long can they go on playing video games? How long can they go on doing uh, online teaching? But let me come back to the poor children. You know, I yes, actually there is a coincidence of now that there is summer vacations for schools and it should have been logically closed, you know, for, for many of the government schools in the country. It's, it's not so for the CBSE schools, but otherwise most government schools closed down during the months of uh, April up to the June first week. And during this time, children do uh, are in the house because this summer it is mad hot and uh, the children really uh, are at home. Many of them go out, they swim if they are in the rural area and uh, they walk around with friends. That is not happening at the moment. Also in the rural area, I think, when children are not in school, at least they were not hungry, you know, because the parents worked and there was some income, there were reserves of food, and home was not a place where they felt insecure. 
but i think it is different for children now in the sense that although they're spending more time with the mother and with father at home there is a gloom in the families and that will have to be rectified but at somewhere i think uh, being out of school and being at home in a condition of insecurity and in a condition of there not being enough reserves of food is certainly going to affect the poor uh, children in a very very harsh uh, manner you made a, you make an in, a important point about uh, food and some form of security and of course the ability to play uh, and interact with their friends um a lot of children uh, in rural india depend on meals that they get, get inside schools right and uh, that access is completely shut down at the moment absolutely absolutely i think i should have mentioned that also you know in many many states uh, when schools close down for summer there is a pressure from the ngos and others saying that even if there are no schools there should be a noon meal going on you know and it it does happen often and on that noon meals are provided even if there are no schools but here unfortunately even when there is hunger even when there is no access to food reserves children are being deprived of the noon meal it's only in kerala where dry rations are being sent home you know through the anganwadi worker and no no noon meal has been stopped in kerala i think this should be followed uh, all over the country usually you know uh, these uh, when uh, rations are being distributed they are actually being distributed to those who have ration cards even in the villages and we have found when we did a survey that uh, for those who didn't have ration cards of course food is not being distributed for those who are migrant labor only the adults are counted and children are not counted for so there is a big uh, uh responsibility uh, of the government to see that children's food is taken care of even if there are no uh, schools in the afternoon you know is and in schools uh, uh, during this covid time uh, it, it it's it doesn't cost much and it doesn't mean need much governance or logistics it just has to be uh, distributed and i'm sure if they let the decision to the gram panchayat decentralize the whole uh, issue gram panchayats would come up with their solutions on how to reach out to every household where there are children and send their entitlement to food to their house but in a situation where there is a large num- large population of india stuck on the highways roads still walking back to their villages how is it possible for for gram panchayats or even state governments to reach out to these populations i think uh, it is really pathetic that these people should have been actually walking back uh, to their homes and that should not have been there at all and arrangements should have been made for entire families with children to reach home safely it's not difficult even this kind of discussion is coming on in the newspaper among all of us saying that if they could arrange for special aircrafts to get uh, passengers from all over the world couldn't they have made arrangements for the poor to go back home and uh, i think this is really sad and if you ask me how can they do it i think wherever they step in that local government will have to take responsibility for these uh, uh people and and they're not to be seen as if they belong to bihar or chatisgarh or or orissa uh, but they have to be treated as indian citizens and they belong to all they're creating wealth for you and me and at least now we should recognize that without their contribution none of us could have even survived the kind of luxury that we have no more we can go about looking at them as belonging to a state they belong to the entire country and the whole country will have to be responsible for these families and these children and uh, in fact you know solutions are never difficult to get by it, it, it is uh, uh, we always found that there are solutions what is difficult to get by is the leadership at every level and that i think is sadly lacking so so you're saying that if we if we had right leadership from bottom to the top 
we would have been able to find solutions to this problem rather than them being on the roads without food is it not happening in kerala again you know let's go to where things are happening and let's also see the kind of phenomenal work some ngos are doing to reach out to them on the main road you have seen videos that are coming on the kind of support they are giving and these are unseen uh, uh, invisible heroes who don't even want to be given publicity but out of sheer compassion and they are not so well to do people ordinary people are doing extraordinary things to help their fellow people when they are walking back to their villages and i would also include include uh, some uh, uh, policemen who were good of course we have heard other stories of policemen but i have heard stories of how gentle and kind policemen were how kind of municipal ward members were how kind the revenue officials were i think we build our energy on a people in the system and outside the system who have shown phenomenal energy to take care of the poor this is a very small number a fraction but i think uh, that they went against the current and they are showing us that it is possible to in fact protect our children and the poor could you share a couple of stories that inspired you um I, in in fact uh, i i would share what was happening in many ngos and in our own organization where they have you know you have these grassroots level organizers who have gone from house to house in their neighborhood making out lists of those who have not got access to uh, rations you know and then trying to sort of link them to the policemen to to the municipal uh, ward members to the village panchayats and they are putting their lives also to risk so i have seen so many of them you will see the kind of list they have made they have started community kitchens i have known about a group uh, in orissa that has started a community kitchen with their own resources and and with their own uh, money you know uh, uh, and uh, also systematically distributing it uh, house to house i have seen organizers going house to house of course maintaining distance to find out if children are doing well and in fact they even distributed something like uh, snakes and ladders new board games which they have never seen and now i know there are many number of board games but you know people who had never played board games with families the carrom boards have coming up snakes and ladders ludo these are the things that are being introduced i've seen cases uh, stories where story books are being uh, given to children in those families so there are any number of ways in which i think the ngos especially are able to reach out to children give them a voice hear them there have been instances where child marriages have been stopped you know uh, so i have not come across instances where sexual abuse uh, you know that i hear from cases that have been heard in the child line but otherwise on generally making children uh, engage uh, engaging with them there are several stories uh, i think which is quite inspiring so despite these positive stories uh, of course um, a lot of uh, regular or day to day business has been stopped for example uh, the frontline workers would go and immunize the children um, yeah. and often often this was the normal course of uh, working but right now all of this has been stopped uh, how do you think this will affect the long term health of children in rural india oh it's going to be really very difficult to take care of the backlog immunization has completely stopped you know uh, and uh, it was going on in such a systematic fashion in the entire country and we were almost uh, doing it uh, in a as a term key pro- program uh, which i think if children have missed their doses in the, for two to three months continuously then it would be a lot of backlog it's not just children even mothers you know uh, who are pregnant they need to be immunized and that immunization is also not happening in fact what we have found out that because they have not been immunized they are not getting their benefits 
the the cash transfers that the mother should get because the condition to get a trans cash transfer is that you have to be immunized if there is no immunization there is no cash transfer and why must there be a link now under covid times you know and these are kinds of things that are bottlenecks that have to be overcome but i can tell you that this is going to be a huge crisis on how do you overcome such a big gap in the immunization program you know uh, i really don't know how we are going to fill this up but i am sure that again with leadership somewhere we will have to discuss this in the public in the open you know and talk about these uh, issues of immunization health care uh, as critical issues it's very very important so uh, just to uh, bring forth for our audience you are saying that there are cash transfers that are directly linked to women being immunized and children being immunized in india women being immunized you and get your maternity benefit if you have been immunized then that is a conditionality you know this is a way of making sure that women have their tetanus injection you know uh, but then if that conditionality is not possible but they should get their maternity benefits and usually the maternity benefits are made in two installments or three installments why must it be in so many installments why can't they trust a woman she know they all know she's pregnant they all know she's carrying why can't you give the whole amount at one go you know these are the things i think one will have to be more compassionate about and start uh, thinking through uh, rather than go by the rule book you know sometimes you have to change rules because rules are to make it easy for the poor to access entitlements not to make it difficult so this is very interesting uh, that uh, not only are the poor losing out on what is their entitlement but also ways in which they could uh, continue their lives um shantadi uh, you've spoken about how children would go out and play on the fields and take a swim in the ponds and in some ways this would make them happy and you know take them away from the daily difficulties of their existence um how do you think this covid crisis will impact their mental health um i have heard some uh, uh, people talk about mental health you know and they say that don't be so alarmed children are resilient they can cope they have ways of coping so uh, in a in a way it does affect them but they do uh, i think their mental health uh, issues are much more about insults and humiliations personal insults and humiliation they face the discrimination that they go through which would happen even if there is no covid you know uh, if it is not an insult if it is not a humiliation uh, if it is not uh, discrimination then i think the children will just cope uh with this if the family atmosphere is supportive encouraging and telling them that look these are uh, we will pass by this kind of a, uh, a situation so i would i should think it it is not a cause for much worry although you find that the ministry of family health and family welfare if anything they did creative at all are having those colorful books for children on mental health Uh, you know somewhere mental health emotional well being is seen as a problem it is a problem but the most creative aspects of dealing with children has been perhaps some consultant who could uh, design a beautiful colorful book on mental health and not one book many books on mental health uh, i i think we will have to think through this uh, issue carefully you know this mental health issue has come up in many places in situations of war In, in, in all over the country in situations of conflict in, in in india also you have this issue of mental health of children who are uh, in areas of civil unrest and conflict they have gone through enormous trauma and anxiety they have been loss uh, of uh, their own relatives they in uh, say for instance in uh, many of these uh, uh, maoos areas or even kashmir so let us look at these profound issues of mental health and how they have coped with it and what kind of support they needed and whether we did anything for them at all if we did something there we would have had enough arrangements to 
take care of children going through mental health now here. But I don't think India has much experience in tackling mental health at terms uh, during times of uh, disaster, conflict, uh, and I suppose now COVID times. So there is there is an important need to build capacities within uh, families and communities to deal with the mental health crisis. It is, it is. But at the same time, I would think that uh, there is an exaggeration about mental health. I may be wrong, but I've learned. I have heard some people after I was asked to speak. I've heard some uh, persons who are experts on the matter who talk about uh, children being resilient and. Uh, it's more the uh, personal humiliation uh, which causes an emotional trauma. And, of, and I would also say the anxiety of all those children who are hungry and uh, going through starvation. These cause the kind of mental health which are very different from uh, children who have parents who have some kind of reserves and who can take care of their children. One of the... Um unintended or uh, crisis that that people are saying might emerge is that we have we may have children who are orphaned because of the number of deaths uh, or disabilities that this um, uh, crisis will sure. cause uh, sure. what 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 do you think is the best way to deal with it and if, if such a crisis is emerging I, 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 I very well anticipate uh, uh, loss of uh, parents loss not due to COVID maybe, but due to hunger and starvation and uh, abandonment of children and uh, uh, making them feel lonely. These, these are, uh, this is something one can anticipate. I think here it is so important again to look at it in a decentralized fashion and perhaps break it into its lowest uh, denominator where in a particular area, you are able to track every child living in that area and bring up uh, support systems and uh, support mechanisms for them. Here, I think there is a huge role for the DCPU, District uh, uh, you know, uh, Child Protection Units. We have all these edifices, no? We have a DCPU, we have a VCPU. I mean, there's so much of the juvenile justice system that has been designed to take care of precisely children who are in need of care and protection. Maybe the government must trust them, give them investments, park a lot of money there, and see that these children who are so vulnerable, so abandoned, are reached out to. What is the point in having a child welfare committee or a child line or an entire ICPS system when there is just no funding there and no money there for them to even operate. If we really cared, I think all the systems in the juvenile justice system has to be strengthened and not give, there's hardly some 600 million or 800 million rupees for, for uh, sorry, crore rupees for the entire protection of 479 million children in the country. Can you believe it? I, it's not a small country, it's a huge country, and you don't have enough investments in their well-being and protection. I think we will have to demand for decentralization of all the child protection systems and greater investments in them and trust them to embrace children who are uh, left out, even without any support, many of these DCPUs are working. But then just give them the support, give them the finances, give them an office room and an office space. And why will they not work? I, I think we will have to trust the institutions that we have and support them. So just for our audiences, the Village Child Protection Committee and the District Child Protection Office, they are meant for uh, protecting children's rights. Right. Right. Correct. And, correct. And, and they have... They have been mandated under the Juvenile Justice Act. You know, it's not that there is just an office that is kept there. You have this I see integrated child protection system. You have the Child Welfare Committee. You have the Juvenile Justice Board. You, you have the Child Line. You have all these institutions that have been 
laid out what is the point in laying down all these systems and institutions when you have not given them uh, the funds to carry it out to its logical conclusion in spite of it let me tell you so many of them are working so well they are just using the authority that has come to them through the act and they're stretching themselves to reach out to uh, children but why should it be like that you know and uh, I, it is it is indeed uh, uh, it speaks of how much the system actually puts primacy of children in the country's democracy if it cared then you would have done much more in the institutions that are meant for children somewhere it looks like it doesn't care enough surely there are a lot of stories about a lack of care um one of the uh, landmark reports that comes on education every year is the asar report uh, yeah. which, which, which says that you know someone in class 3 can't can't you know read or write material in yeah. class and so on and so forth uh do you think these learning challenges will widen um because of the amount of time children will be out of school or do you think this will be uh, this this such this this will remain as is uh actually i i uh i have to wear two hats the pessimist and the optimist hat uh you know uh, uh i if if one is pessimistic and probably realistic then i can say that uh, it is going to be difficult to revive schools after the covid it needs a lot of uh, support and especially uh, you know when children have uh, been hungry when children have uh, come from homes that are uh, that have been denied uh, their right to dignity to get them back to school itself is going to be a uh, a problem so there you have to be somewhere uh, uh, you know in a mood to be learning and studying after this kind of a thing and we have to create that kind of an atmosphere for a child to get back to school considering the manner in which schools are running uh, the government schools are running these children are in any case neglected i wouldn't say it's not it doesn't reflect on the child's capacity to learn it reflects on the system's capacity to teach these children and uh, if they now have to address children who are also uh, not in a mood i do not know if the uh, system can really uh, take care of these children it is going to be a huge crisis uh, uh, you know i if you look at the new education policy it did talk about there being a crisis in learning a learning crisis uh, and it it had about two three chapters only on learning crisis in the country and with covid uh, i think it's a bigger thing to me it's more than a learning crisis it's a crisis in the education system as a whole you know do they respect uh, the poor do they respect the first generation learner do they respect the dalit do they respect the adivasi do they respect children who don't who come to school without a bath without proper clothes you know these i think are questions that will have to be asked and they may even get compounded now after covid and i do hope wearing my optimist hat that the education system learns to respect the children if it learns children will learn i think the lacuna is in the system which does not learn about the poor it should start learning about the poor then i'm sure poor children will start coping uh, with uh, anything they will look forward to go to schools make an interesting point about the system wanting to learn uh, and the need for the system to learn a little while ago the supreme court of india uh and the chief justice made a comment saying that why do the poor need money when we are providing them food uh it was a very it, it it was widely reported in media and many commentators said that uh the judges don't understand the life of a migrant worker which can be said for all of middle class india and, and you know pretty much anyone um who doesn't understand the poor what are the ways in which we can create compassionate or just systems where these these things are learned 
we, where we don't have judges or where we don't have officers who come into the system without understanding any of these issues i think you're uh, uh, posing a fundamental uh, question uh, uh, you know and and the lack of sensitivity uh, among the indian uh, i would say upper middle class and the elite about the poor lack of knowledge indifference to the poor and a condescending uh, attitude uh, you know about them that they have not made it so they are not good enough and we are the success stories in this country uh, i think it's a huge challenge and somewhere it, it, these uh, attitudes uh, have been deeply in uh, you know entrenched in the mind of the middle class there we have not as democratic as we think we are and somewhere we they will have to know that the definition of democracy is beyond voting rights it is voting rights it is participation in election but they must know that democracy also means equality democracy also means social justice democracy also means inclusion and if none of these are there in their mindsets they are actually perpetuating an anti democratic culture in the country they will have to understand democracy in its real sense and how to make them understand democracy in its real sense has got to do with popular movements and uprising it won't happen automatically let me tell you they will not learn. they will they, they have been socialized into an atmosphere who think that they are doing people a favor you know and and somewhere i think they will have unless there is democratization of politics where the poor capture spaces nobody is going to invite the poor to play a role in democracy they will have to fight and in those struggles in those fights i think you me like minded people will have to become the support structures to see their win their battles for education their battles for health their battles for representation and it is so important where we clearly define our roles where we support when there is agency from below they are it's time we don't play any leadership role we will have to support the leadership that is emerging in an organic process and uh, see that those battles are successful unless a battle uh, is Uh, whatever for me doesn't have a battle need not be a war with arms it could be an ideological battle that has to be won if it is not won i think this tension will go on and on and there will be a cushy luxurious uh, debate of the elite uh, about what we have to do with poor so democracy in its true sense can can reduce the chasm between uh what we want our country to be uh and what it is right now uh, uh i i want to i i want to ask you a question about dignity you said that uh, you know a, a lot of children will will face in indignity continue to face indignity um and as first generation learners or as young people as very young children when they are experiencing such exclusion uh how do you think uh these children what will be the impact uh, of of on the minds of these children when they grow up how will they remember these times and how is it that we can engage right now in some form of healing as a society i think you will have to have one kind of a covid i mean one kind of a similar discussion with some dalit students who are now in the postgraduate level on how they cope with discrimination with insults and humiliation and what their views are on what is happening and how they think that they will have to expand their base and i can only i cannot put myself in that position really i cannot but i think i only hope that the covid is going to sort of uh, sensitize and uh, maybe the judge you're talking is an exception but i'm sure that what has Uh, happened with the covid is that the plight of the migrant workers has become more visible people never even knew that there were so many of them who were uh, uh, in our cities and towns and that our lives were so interdependent on what they were doing they were totally invisible perhaps the covid has 
has in fact given uh, sensitivity to many of us. So let us not give up on them. Let us look at how they have been able to see what in true India is and true India has been uh, because of COVID, you know, and perhaps we have to build on that, that evidence. Uh, it, it's, it's important. Sometimes you have to uh, turn uh, uh, something uh, which is so disadvantageous to an advantage, uh, you know, and, uh, and show this is quite an eye opener for many, you, you know, I, I'm sure it is an eye-opener for many, uh, the way people have uh, drawn to go back homes. They are no different. The poor are no different. They also have a home. They may not be the kind of home we are in, but they also have a home. They also want to get back to their homes. They have to support them. And they're like you and me. So that kind of a message that came across due to, through this uh, COVID, I think, has to be strengthened and we have to win over more and more from the middle class to think like you and me. So clearly uh, there is a there, there is a lot to be learned from stories of hope and maybe we can hope that there is sensitivity uh, in, in parts of society that were uh, ignorant of this. I want to shift your attention to the urban poor. Uh, right. And, and especially children who are on the streets, children who are homeless, uh, often have homes uh, in the city but have run away or homes in villages but, you know, work in the city. Uh, there's, there's common perception that these are children in conflict with law and in need of protection. Uh, how do you think the police brutality uh, or, the, or the shutdown of cities would have affected these, these children? Uh, you know, I have been trying to get uh, information on what is happening to street children, where are they, and how have they uh, surviving. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, this has been a huge gap in the information that I personally have on how they are uh, surviving. I know about Rainbow Homes, I know about MV Foundation, I know about many of us who run homes for uh, street children, and I think they're all very secure. And uh, they also want to do more. You know, somewhere all of them feel that it is now their responsibility to take care of those who are uh, on the streets. And they really want an opportunity to do more, to see that their uh, peer group, which is outside, is, is being taken care of. So I know what is happening to children who are in a shelter home and how well they are being taken care of and how much they want to do more for other children. But I'm not able to get enough information on what is happening to those children who are homeless on the streets. Uh, they, there are a couple of them here and there in the temporary shelters that have been created by the state. But uh, really, I do, uh, I, I, unfortunately, this, there has been an information gap about them. But I do know about what is happening to children who were child laborers and migrant child labor. You know, uh, and uh, how. Uh, in the country, it could be in Hyderabad, uh, it could be in Jaipur, it could be on the brick hills, uh, it could be uh, on uh, sweatshops and hotels and dabas. How all these migrant children have been just left abandoned by the employers. They have gone away to their homes to, at a safer place, leaving them behind. And these children, sometimes there are 50 or 60 of them have been left kind in a small dungeon like space because for them the workspace and the way they live are all the same and no food for them and they don't even know how to get back home and their plight I think is is absolutely horrendous and uh, uh, except of course when there has been some NGO that has tried to rescue them uh, they have been totally invisible you know uh, and uh, it is these children I think that one worries for and because one knows that uh, they're just not able to get back home. We've heard the story of this girl who walked back from her chili farm, 150 kilometers from Khamam, uh, back into Bijapur in Chhattisgarh and uh, she couldn't do it. Just an hour before she reached home, she just collapsed. God knows what kind of plans each one of these children who are trapped in these sweatshops are thinking on how to get back home. 
you know, they're in prison and uh, it's for no fault of theirs. And there has not been any report about how there has been a rescue of uh, government for them. There has been no policy decision. You have had policies for uh, adults, migrant labor, but there has not been a single policy announcement or decision about what you may do for children, child labor, who have gone as traffic child labor and uh, who have uh, gone, uh, I mean, uncared for, unprotected, no directions, no guidelines, nothing. You know, and these, I, I, it, it is very worrying uh, that, uh, you know, we have just not raised the debate on these children uh, at a national level. At this point, I'd like to uh, tell the audience that they can put in their questions uh, on any of the platforms that they're in, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, and we'll be happy to uh, ask those questions to, to Shantaji. Uh, but Shantaji, I, I want to um, point out that a lot of these children who, are, uh, who fall in the urban poor category, who are migrant labor, uh, essentially are a chil children with a lot of independent spirit. They are not used to asking others for help and are quite uh, self-dependent. What do you think um, in this situation where everyone has been left helpless, how would, how would their mental state be uh, when they're not able to ask for any help from anyone? I, th I think there is a, <laughs> this is a genuine uh, uh, problem. This is where the issue of dignity you know, or, or, or children on the streets actually happen because they're so self-respecting. They have such self-esteem, and they would uh, they would think that they can take care of themselves. But they do need to unlearn a lot. And even without COVID times, I think they must know that. Uh, look, you can carry on with such self-esteem for some time in your life, but not for all the time in your life. When you're a child, fine, but you can't continue like that forever and ever. And you need support. You need education. You need uh, rescue. You need to be equal with others. And you need to realize your fullest potential. You may have self-esteem, but your fullest potential has not been recognized or even realized. So somewhere there has to be talking to them. This is what is happening in all our shelter homes. They, when they do come, they come with the attitude that you're talking about, but they know that that attitude is not going to help them compete in a modern world. They will have to learn much more. They will have to have many more skills. So I think many NGOs also sometimes glorify the aspect of the dignity that you're talking about of the street children and without giving them the kind of support to unlearn and to reintegrate into society uh, where they can call shots on their own terms. After some time, they can't call shots. They become addicts, they become uh, vulnerable, they become uh, uh, victims of police atrocities. You know, uh, so of what use is all the self esteem when they have no capacities uh, to enjoy uh, equal rights as citizens of the country? So dignity and capacities uh, to be able to enjoy a full full life is what we need uh, for children. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Would, uh, because you have self-esteem and dignity, would we send our child onto the street? Go live because that is a better freedom that you have. Would you do it to your own child? Absolutely. I mean, we, we will have to sort of uh, somewhere not glorify a street child. You respect them, but you're doing a great harm in glorifying them. I, I also want to uh, ask you that because a lot of children are at home, uh, do you think uh, there is a situation that might emerge where we might have um, early pregnancies or underage pregnancies? Um, and is there is there great potential for child abuse during these times? This it seems uh, there is evidence to show that it has actually happened that there is greater sexual violence and that it has been brought to the notice of the Ministry of Women and Child uh, Development that uh, uh, you know that uh, the calls that have come to the child line about four lakh calls uh, during COVID times many of them are about sexual abuse. 
uh, and violence and domestic violence uh, uh, because men are at home, alcoholic parent, father at home. So this kind of a thing you, you do listen to. But at the same time, let me tell you, in places where the community has been mobilized and charged with protection of children's rights, where there has been an active NGO on the ground, these kinds of incidents do not occur. It, it occurs in places where there has not been a sensitizing on children and their rights. So there are these instances of child marriages and child uh, sexual abuse. But certainly, they are not occurring in areas. And, and these are the positive stories, you know, where there have been strong NGOs on the ground who have worked with children and their voices, who work with families to protect children. In those places, one has not heard of these stories. So where there is greater uh, civil society vigilance, uh, there are less of such instances. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is true. Uh, uh, that's uh, otherwise uh, as victims i think children are the weakest and so they uh, the effect of covid would be on them the most that is what is anticipated you no know? but then again as i said we have to get a lot of energy from things happening and perhaps post covid learn from why it worked there and to see if that can be uh, replicated in other areas so there is a question from the audience, from Varsha Bhargavi. Uh, she asks, what is your advice to Telangana government uh, who do not have any information on migrant workers or child in labor situations to identify and rescue them from work situations? Why only Telangana government? It has to be given an advice to all governments, except perhaps, uh, uh, as I told you, Kerala and one or two uh, states. Uh, you know, uh, in, in, in fact, again, it is the pressure uh, from the NGO on the government to constantly raising the voice without getting frustrated. We will have to say the same thing 100 times, 1000 times, till the government responds about migrant labor, about child labor. There are no shortcuts. You know, we cannot give up our uh, fight. We will have to continuously, and each time you ask, each time you question, you do it as if you questioned it for the first time. It was your, you didn't think of it yesterday. It came to you today. There is something about migrant labor. And then ask the government. Because other, uh, I, I think it's important that we keep questioning and questioning and questioning. There's, there are no shortcuts. And keep feeding concrete data, concrete information. And tell them, look, in this place, there are so many families, they don't have anything. You have to do something. They may not listen, but say it again. Say it again through another media. But that's the only way. In a democracy, these are the only ways in which you raise consciousness of not the civil society, but also the system. You made an important point, Shantaji, that wherever there is civil society uh, or active citizenship, uh, there are lesser cases of violence or discrimination or lack of entitlements. Uh, do you see any possible ways in which civil society across India could club together to address not just the issue of child rights, but many other rights that we are seeing uh, being subverted? I think they're already doing it. When, when you look at the kind of work uh, uh, NGOs are doing uh, on uh, rescue and rehabilitation of uh, 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 workers and on the issue of hunger, none of them is a specialist on this. They're doing women's issues, environment issues, children's issues, uh, housing issues, watershed issues, but all of them have come together through their field level activists and organizers, through their networks to work on hunger, to work on starvation. So I think the civil society is coming together they're sharing experiences, they're jumping orbits, they're, they're discussing, they're talking, which is, again, I think a very positive sign under COVID, because otherwise we were all in our own work. But now we have sort of skipped our orbit and looking at what others have done and joining together. This is happening in the country. I think it's a good thing. And we have to come together. What, what do you think uh, in the coming days, in the in the medium to long term, 
if you were to if you were to prioritize five or six action areas with respect to child rights uh what would those be uh and what would you like the government across the country uh to focus on um as i said i think it is so important to see that every institution that is meant for children in the country we trusted and they are given all the funds that is required to reach out to uh, the most vulnerable and the most needy child in the country i mean the, i think the system we have to strengthen the institutions secondly i think decentralization trust the gram panchayats and get the gram panchayats to track every child they can get the data from schools a school attendance register has the names of every child in the village because according to the government 98% of children are already in school so they have names of 98% of children in the country all that they have to do is get that attendance register and track if that child where the child is and make sure that the child comes back to the village i think that is the second thing and the third thing is of course uh, on uh, uh, getting a migrant child labor back home that is so so uh, important there are protocols of how you may do it uh, you know and i think you will have to do that uh, almost immediately strengthen helpline give give a lot of publicity to the child line there are already helpline calls going on but it is not enough that you only make a call and the child line registers it but build its capacities to respond uh, to the calls let me tell you that in many instances child line sa- uh, staff salaries also don't reach you know of course it has never hindered any of the child lines from doing its work that it is doing they work with our salaries we have these foot soldiers in cwcs and in child lines but that is not enough even if you uh, you have to pay them their salaries but give them enough funds to reach out to people who are making those calls and publicize the helpline uh, you know where it is available for uh, everyone it is so so very uh, important so i i would think decentralization building capacities of institutions getting uh, child labor uh, back and uh, strengthening the uh, ch- child line and of course sending as many messages uh, as possible to children that there are these support structures and these people who they can call or go to in uh, when they are in difficulties i i i am mean, it's difficult to give a menu but i think uh, uh we have to deal with all of this with a sense of uh, uh compassion supreme court had passed an order that uh, children may not be in the homes children in conflict with law they should be sent home nobody knows if they were sent home because their parents may require them you know at home in such difficult times or maybe the other way around maybe the parents are not able to take care of them so will they be continuing the home these kinds of things nobody knows what is happening i think we will have to get into the situation of children in conflict with law in the homes and also children in need of care and protection in the home to see how well they have been taken care of my final question to you uh, before we end for the day Uh, you spoke about how uh, a lot of the children in shelter homes especially the ones that you know uh, have a lot of energy uh, to go out and support um, the uh, the other children who are stuck in what ways are you letting them contribute and and is there some inspiration that you get by looking at their spirit <laughs> you know it's a, a, a difficult question but i i only know of those who are there looking at their spirit because people in our homes you trust them you trust their capacities and you find that they are doing phenomenal work for themselves and for the others they are informed by a sense of justice and also a sense of injustice that is happening and they they want to change reality not just for themselves but for others also so that is always there there will maybe they are not doing it because they have to reconstruct their own lives and they are going forward in that is a very big uh, challenge but you touch them they will tell you about how much they care for every other child in the country 
you know, that softness that they have is something we should all learn from them, you know, and their sense of uh, justice, their sense of something very wrong is happening and we have to correct it. I think these are the things that we learn from those who have coming from very, very deprived backgrounds and who have made it or who have been given the possibility of becoming someone, transforming themselves. They have not lost their sense of justice. And that is what one learns from them. So their tenderness and their sense of justice is what should keep our spirits alive. And uh, I think one of the key messages that you've given us, Shantaji, today is that we should focus on the stories of hopes, uh, take our energies from what is going right, and use it to, to ensure that the right things happen for all the children who are in distress today. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. Uh, also, Martha from Signable for translating uh, all of this in sign language. Uh, uh, thank you for the audience for joining and listening to us. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Bye bye.